excellent. So I just checked to see if this is working. Oh, good. Excellent. So uh, in 1993, uh, in my first year of art college, I got my first ear piercing. And I know it doesn't, it's nothing terribly radical now, but back then, in those days, uh, particularly in conservative Christian circles, it was quite a big deal. I thought it was edgy, uh, but my grandparent thought it was, my granddad particularly, he thought it was uh, sketchy. Uh, and uh, since that I was staying with them uh, in my first year of college, I thought oh, I, I should hear him out. So he sat me down, uh, he whipped out the Bible uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 25, uh, where it says, A man should not wear women's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Now, clearly, Granddad thought that uh, only women wear earrings, uh, and in his generation and, and culture, uh, that was true. But I was pretty sure, I was pretty sure that the Bible had instances of dudes wearing earrings, uh, and I found in the book of Exodus, in the law of Moses, that ear, pi ear piercing was actually encouraged. So here it is. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door of the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl, and then he will be his servant for life. So there you go. Ha! Piercings allowed for dudes uh, in the Bible. Now, to be fair, I didn't get my ear pierced out of love for my master. Um, <laughs> or did I? Maybe I was a slave to fashion. Which, let me tell you, was pretty tragic looking uh, back in those days. A mullet and some uh, awful chunky glasses. Uh, an earring did not add to the <laughs> sartorial elegance of my 19-year-old self back then. Uh, it was not improved. If I was a slave to anything, it was the delusion uh, that I was being edgy. Um, <laughs> but we're all slaves to something, aren't we? And what we wear, what we do, what we spend our time on, what we spend our money on, that can say a lot about who our master actually is. And God knows who the best master for us is. Which is why he's inspired Jude to write this letter, which we're looking at today, starting to look at today, which, to start off, tells us a couple of uh, things. Firstly, to be a slave of Jesus. If we're going to be slaves to someone or something, uh, let's be slave, slaves to the only one who's worth it. So let's be slaves to Jesus. Uh, and secondly, what that looks like. And it looks like agonising for the faith about him. So that's where we're going. And that's what the, the first couple of uh, parts of this letter uh, take us to. So first up, slaves, being slaves to Jesus. This is certainly uh, something that he thought of uh, himself as. Uh, up front, he identifies himself as Jude, a servant of Christ Jesus and a brother of James. Now, uh, I've just happened to written uh, these up on some of the boards, so I'll just angle it so that you can see it over there. All right. You guys can see that? Everyone can see that? Yep. Okay. So, the word here, servant, uh, that is actually a word, it's called doulos, all right, in the Greek. So, in uh, the original language of the Bible, it was originally Greek, and the word is doulos. And probably a better way to translate doulos, in this context at least, is slave, all right? not servant. Sometimes it gets translated as servant, but here in this context, in Jude, probably slave is better. Why do I say that? Well, because in verse 4, it talks about Jesus, Jude mentions Jesus being uh, Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Now, the word, the Greek word that's translated sovereign there is uh, the word called <laughs> and it's called despotan, which is where we get the word despot, all right? Which sounds bad, I know, uh, but in, back in those days, it was just referring to someone who had slaves. So it was a slave owner. And so uh, I think then a better translation of this word, of despotan, 
uh, is master. And that is the case in some translations of the Bible. It'll say, Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. Which makes sense uh, why Jude understands himself uh, to be a slave of Jesus. A slave of Jesus. Uh, Not uh, a slave of Jesus, not actually his brother, which he could have legitimately said, right? Uh, Because James, that he mentions in verse 1, is actually Jesus' brother. You can see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Uh, We're told of all Jesus' family there, and James was Jesus' brother, and so Jude is very much exactly a brother as well of Jesus. Now, that'd be a pretty big name drop, right? Like, if you could say that, you would, right? Uh, It's probably the biggest. Oh, yeah, hey, by the way, I'm Jesus' brother. Uh, (coughs) Yeah, you you heard of him, the miracle worker, the guy who died and rose again? Yeah, I'm his brother, yeah. Yeah. It'd be like saying uh, you're Taylor Swift's sister, except people would actually care. Um, (laughs) I'm Jesus' brother. Uh, As a teenager uh, growing up in Coffs Harbour, I was good mates with a guy called Matt. Uh, Every teenage boy back then was called Matt. I don't know what uh, parents were thinking, thanks. But every second person was called Matt. Anyway, my Matt, he was pretty well known in Coffs Harbour at the time. Everybody knew him. Uh, He was a local radio presenter, he was an actor, he was very charismatic, a big personality. And if I was mixing with people that I didn't know, uh, I'd just drop his name and then tell him, oh yeah, I'm actually a pretty close friend, and I'd get instant cred. Now imagine if you were the brother of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, like blood brother. Surely you'd be whipping that fact out as often as you could. But not Jude, He's, he's actually at pains to hide the link. He says he's the brother of James, not Jesus, right? The brother of James, not Jesus, even though he is the brother of Jesus, just as much as James is. It seems he's keen for there to be no sense of special pleading for him. Just because he's Jesus' brother, uh, that just like anyone else who knows Jesus, that first and foremost, along with them, what he want, what's he want to be known as? A slave. Of Jesus. He wants to be known as Jesus' slave, that Jesus is his master. A few years ago, I asked my younger brother, Tim, how he'd feel calling me Lord and Master. <laughs> He's still thinking about it. Uh, but not Jude with Jesus. Uh, at one stage, along with the rest of his family, Jude thought that Jesus was out of his mind. So what happened? Something must have happened to change his mind. Maybe the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and likely appeared to him in the flesh, that might have done it. It's not a wonder then that Jude comes around to seeing that Jesus was far, far more than his brother. That in fact he was his master, his despotin. Uh, Not just like... Now, I know that despot sounds bad... Uh, Just like slave sounds bad because of the association often of of slavery to the transatlantic slave trade or maybe the global sex trafficking market. And so whenever we hear the word slave, I get it, it's always kind of a bad association. The idea of being anyone's slave is a bad thing. Except here's the thing. Apart from the fact that slavery in Jude's day and in his context and in his culture uh, was more civilised as we saw earlier, God's law anticipated that some slaves might actually love their master so much that they want to get ear piercings for them. Uh, But apart from that, the Bible makes it pretty clear that you and I, that every person is a slave. We can't not but be a slave. The Apostle Paul, he says elsewhere, uh, in Romans chapter 6, don't you know that you are slaves to the one you obey? Now, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. And we all know that's true, right? We're all slaves to the one that we obey, whether that be to our own sinful desires, or someone else's desires, or to God's desires. We're all slaves. Even though we might think we're free doing whatever we want, we're actually slaves. Have you ever noticed when anyone says, it's free country, it's invariably after they're doing something dodgy? 
Yeah. To justify it. They're not, they're not free. They're just a slave to a bad attitude. Uh, in the same way, we might think we're free to run after whatever we want rather than what God wants. It's a free country, right? But we're actually just proving we're slaves. Slaves to our own dodgy, sinful desires, which ultimately lead to death. Now, Jude's going to have a little bit more to say on that later in his letter. But for now, it's fair to say that we're all slaves. And Jude's picked his master. That's Jesus. And Jesus, unlike every other master, Jesus not only promises but delivers on good, good things. Things not just for Jude but for any who are a slave of Jesus. As Jude says there in verse 1 again, To those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. It's incredible to think that if we're trusting in Jesus, it's because God has decided to call us before creation. To those who have been called in Christ, the reality is that God chose you before you ever chose him. Eternity past is set for you in Christ. God has you in the past. And all those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus are loved now in God uh, the Father. So our present is covered as those who are trusting in Jesus. And also our future. Jude makes uh, the point we are kept for Jesus Christ, kept for him, for eternal life with God our Father and God. Christ. It's amazing and wonderful to think then that in some ways the mercy, peace and love that Jude wishes all those who are trusting in Jesus upon them is already ours in the past, in the present and for the future. We are abundantly objects of mercy, peace and God's love. We are loved incredibly. As slaves of Jesus, our past, our present, our future, they are all tied up in the life, the death and the resurrection of our master. His past is our past. He died to sin to bring God's forgiveness for us. His present is our present. He lives to God in the love of the Father and his future is our future. We are kept for him for eternal glory. Who wouldn't want to be a slave of Jesus? Now, having said all this, all this in Jesus, being slaves, Jude says, is all tied up, slaves to Jesus, is all tied up with what we do with the faith, which brings us to the next point. Agonizing for the faith. As Jude writes, he wants his readers, he wants us to contend or struggle for the faith. So there in verse 3, we read, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith. It seems, as Jude was thinking about, he, uh, imagine you know, he's preparing himself a hot chocolate, uh, he's thinking about his mates that he's going to write to, uh, and he's sat down to write this letter, uh, and he's excited about all the things that he wants to talk about, uh, with them about the salvation that they share, the good things that God has done for them and that they enjoy in Jesus. And he's getting all revved up to wax on about the goodness of God. But then he spies maybe a letter on his uh, bedside table that he's just recently received and uh, it's got some concerning information in it about his friends. Some dodgy brothers are throwing some shade on the gospel. They're twisting the truth, the good news of Jesus, and they're misleading people. And so while Jude starts off in a sunny place, kind of all eager... Uh, to unpack and enjoy the salvation he shares with his fellow Christians, his, his mood turns. It turns from happy eagerness to serious compulsion, from joy to alarm, uh, from not just enjoying the salvation that we have in Jesus, but to urging his readers, urging us to fight for it, to contend or to, to struggle for the faith. And isn't that just a little bit like life, Right? You start your day happy, but then you wake up. 
You think things are good, uh, but it's only because you haven't waited long enough. <laughs> you know, don't worry, just wait a little longer. Things will get bad. Now you might think, well, that's a little bit you know, glass half empty kind of thinking. <laughs> but surely what's in the glass is more important than whether, whether it's half full or half empty, <laughs> right? And the simple reality is that we've all got trouble in our glass. Half full or half empty, who cares? I'm sure all of us don't want any trouble in there. We want a glass that's totally empty of trouble. But that's not life, is it? It's not reality. We all have to struggle with trouble. Struggle with trouble in life and in faith. We all have to struggle in our faith. And so according to Jude, we have to fight and struggle for the faith. Now, the faith that Jude is talking about there uh, is the objective content of what Christians believe as passed down from Jesus through the apostles and recorded in something that most of us hopefully have a copy of. What's that? The Bible. That's right. That's meant to be a book, right? The good news about Jesus passed on from him to the apostles recorded in the Bible. So that the faith that Jude is talking about here is that's the faith contained in the Bible. The truths about God revealed in the person of his son Jesus contained in the Bible. And Jude's saying we need to contend for this. We need to contend for it. We need to struggle for the truth of who Jesus is and what he's on about. Why? Because it's under attack. It's under attack. It was under attack in Jude's day. And as Jude hints, it'll always be under attack from certain people, just as the scriptures anticipate. So, so Jude writes, for certain individuals... Uh, whose condemnation was written about long ago in the scriptures, have secretly slipped in among you. You know, for all the threats out there in the world that might be against the truth of Jesus, you know, political action, cancel culture, Jude's concern is more what's going on inside the church, among his fellow Christians. And what's alarming is that whoever these dodgy brothers are, in Jude's day, they've slipped in secretly. No one even noticed. Now, Jude goes on to give uh, a little bit of an idea of how they operate there in verse 4. They pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus. And he's going to unpack a little bit more what that looks like in the rest of his letter, so that his readers, so that people like us, uh, might be uh, less easily duped by dodgy brothers. Uh, but we'll look more at those things with Jude in the following weeks. What's worth focusing on now is the whole struggling or contending for the faith thing. I'm going to get all Greek on you again, because Greek's cool. Particularly Greek in the Bible. The word contend there uh, comes from the word... Uh, and I'm, if I spell it incorrectly, all you Greek heads, uh, <laughs> did I? Yes. I did despotin. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is... Uh, Greek word agonizomai. All right, it's where we get the word agonize. Agonize. It's what... Uh, it was a word that was used particularly to talk about those, an athlete, what an athlete does. They agonise for the goal, to win the goal. Or someone who's at war, they agonise to win the battle. And Jude is saying, you need to agonise for the faith. You need to strive and fight for it, to keep it, to agonise for it. I, uh, I came across this story the other day. Uh, it's a guy called um, Tony Sicoria. That's his name, I think. 
well, I'm pr uh, that is his name, whether I'm pronouncing it or not <laughs> correctly is, is the uh, matter at hand. Anyway, this guy, uh, a number of years ago, he got struck by lightning. He was in a phone booth in the middle of a, uh, a storm. He was talking to his mum, and he was, his mum had just hung up, and he was putting the receiver down, and the lightning bolt hit the top of the booth, travelled through the, the line of the receiver, and jumped from the receiver into his face, went through his body, and exited through his uh, left foot. Left foot. Uh, and it blew him out of the uh, phone booth. <laughs> uh, now, he didn't die, but as he re uh, recovered from his burns and the shock, uh, over two or three days, he got an, an insatiable urge to listen to piano music, even though he'd never really been interested in piano at all before. He had no interest, in fact. Uh, and so he began buying records of piano music. Uh, then he got an urge to play the piano, so he, so he was able to procure a piano. He bought, started buying sheet music, he learned to read it, he taught himself how to play, and then he started, after that, hearing music in his head. And in a desperate desire, and it was just there constantly, all the time, and in a des desperate desire to kind of get it out, he got piano lessons, uh, <laughs> and he, he said this, it was a terrible struggle, he said. I, I would uh, get up at four in the morning, and I'd play till I went to work, then I got home from work, I was at the piano all evening. My wife wasn't really pleased. Uh, says, I was possessed. In 2008, he, pu he publicly de debuted playing at the Goodrich Theatre in New York. <laughs> That's where it took him. And he's working on several other solo piano pieces, uh, including a four-hand, two-piano piece, uh, a symphony and a concerto. Uh, his obsession has taken his time, his money, his effort, his life. Everything in his life is geared towards somehow supporting or expressing or encouraging this piano music in his head. He agonises over it. And the simple reality is, for those of us who are trusting in Jesus, whether you feel it all the time or not, We've been struck by God's lightning. And now there is a gospel tune in our head that we'll, we will never, ever be able to shake. Like the music of Tony's head, we'll never be able to shake it. But we have a choice. We can do nothing with it and let it drive us mad with confusion, frustration, and disappointment, or we can agonise over it in the Jude sense of agonise. Like an athlete and a warrior, we can strive and fight for the truth of the gospel. We can agonise for the faith, be obsessive about knowing the faith more and more, what it is and what it isn't, so as to love Jesus more and more. And we'll give our time and our money and our energy and our effort to the pursuit of this. And as we do this, as we make agonising for the faith a thing in our lives, we'll be able to spot a fake more easily, pick a false teacher and false teaching more quickly. So let me ask you, how are you going at agonising for the faith? Do you obsess over the truth about Jesus? Do you regularly read the Bible to study it, to digest it, to meditate on it, to memorise it? Have you considered doing a course of study at a Bible college to get to know the Bible better? You know, Jude hints at one big way that we can all agonize for the faith he says there in verse 2 contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people the faith the truth about Jesus it's entrusted to God's holy people that is to all Christians to you and to me but not to you alone or to me alone but to us together we're to fight, strive, agonise and struggle for the faith. It's not something that we've been given to do by ourselves, it's what we do together because it's been entrusted to us. Which means wherever the Bible is taught or studied or read or agonised over for the purposes of growing together in the knowledge and love of Jesus, that's where we best contend for the faith. Which means wherever this happens, wherever it's at church or in a Bible study group, 
that these should be a priority in our lives. If they're not, then maybe you're not contending for the faith. Maybe you're not agonising for the faith, as you should. And it's likely that you'll get sucked into thinking, like living, uh, thinking and, and living like one of those other dodgy brothers, if you haven't already, and end up denying Jesus Christ as your Lord eventually. My son, my son uh, Lachlan, and I, we've been reading through the Crusades recently, as you do. Uh, you know, those appalling military campaigns instigated by the church about a thousand years ago, inciting Christians to take up arms, principally against Muslims in the Holy Land, and many went. They went to slaughter men, women, and children, all in the name of Christ. With the promise from the popes, and other church leaders at the time, that anyone who did this, that they'd receive forgiveness for all their sins. It is sad to think of the crusaders on their way to slaughter thousands in Jerusalem in the name of Christ, passing probably through Galilee, probably the, the field where Jesus, a thousand years beforehand, said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How did the Crusaders not see the sad irony, the appalling contradiction of what they were doing? It's got to be at least in part that they didn't really know the faith. They thought they were fighting for the faith, but in actual fact, they were fighting for a perversion of the faith. They were fighting for a lie, a demonic and disgusting lie. Now, if we had been one of those illiterate European peasants back then, do you think that we would have been any different? Do you think that we would have not cheered on for the Crusades? Maybe even joined one of them? It would be naive to think that we never would have. The only thing that could have saved us from a path, the only thing that can save us from going down a path that we think God wants, which he actually hates, is if we're agonising for the faith together. That is meeting regularly in church and growth group together to study and digest and meditate and memorise the Bible so that we might know Jesus, truly who he is, more and more and know what he loves more and more. Now look, it's true that going to church and a growth group doesn't make you a Christian, just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. And it may be that you find church and growth group hard sometimes, you know, that your, your hamburger is not cooked exactly the way that you like it all the time. But life as a slave is never easy. Sure, we can, we can be a slave to our personal desires and suffer no one over our preferences and our personal comfort, but you can't be a slave to that and Jesus. And Jesus wants us to agonize for the faith, for the mercy, the peace, the love on offer in the faith. For our own good, Jesus wants us to agonize for the faith, which will look like personally spending regular time reading and studying and meditating and memorizing the Bible. But importantly, it'll also mean it'll look like meeting together for church on Sundays and meeting together during the week in a growth group to get into the Bible together. And we need to fight to make these things a priority in our lives. Not to take a break from church, particularly during the school holidays, because we don't feel like it. Uh, not to turn up a growth group only when we feel like it. Not to study the Bible only when we've got time or when we're in the mood. Because as Jesus slaves... We'll agonize for the faith together. And I'm going to pray that that will be the case for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that in him, our past, our present, our future is set. We, we are loved dearly by you. We have your mercy, your peace and your love in abundance you have bought us with the blood of Jesus. We are his slaves.
Please help us to express that ownership, to declare in our lives Jesus' mastery over us, that he is our master by struggling and contending and agonizing for the faith. Please help us to make it a priority to read and study and digest and and take it into heart and memorize your word, the Bible. To be doing that personally, but importantly to be doing that regularly together. So that we might enjoy, continue to enjoy the mercy, peace and love that you have showered on us in abundance through Jesus, our Master. And we pray this in his name. Amen. We're going to sing our final song together, so let's stand and sing.